Oh, shalom, goddammit, welcome everyone. This is Rabbi Saul Solomon, the founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And I am excited, I am thrilled at the guest that I will be talking to. Now, if I say the word, you're in town, what do you think of? I mean, I know I think of my underpants at four in the morning, but no, it was a smash hit Broadway musical that came out of off-off Broadway and then was developed. And yes, with a name like You're in Town, this thing, it got Tony Awards, it was competing for a bunch of different things, and now it's done all over the place. And the person who wrote the book for this musical, his name is Greg Kotis. He's a nice Jewish boy. He was also an original member of the neo-futurist troupe out in Chicago. And he's got a new batch of one-act plays that are being done at the pit. Now, nothing to do with armpits. This is the People's Improv Theater in New York. It's called Give the People What They Want. I know I want to talk to Greg Kotis because he's on the phone with us right now. Shalom, Greg. Shalom, Rabbi. Oh, Beringer, how are you feeling? How are you doing? How is your New Year so far? My New Year is, is great. I, I love New Year. I love the, the idea that you can start again and start fresh and you can improve yourself. So I'm, I'm in high spirits. Now, did you make any uh, resolutions? Yes, I made a resolution to try to work out more. So I guess that's sort of a boring resolution. Okay, and, no, that's a and, good uh, thing, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's the main one. To work out. How often do you work out now? Well, I work out maybe like once every month. <laughs> You're a lazy bastard, of course, okay. But now you want to do what, twice a month? Now, I have an idea that maybe I'll go to the gym three times a week, but that's, I'll, I'll, that's, that's my overly ambitious resolution for this year. Now, let me ask, mainly, of course, you are a playwright. You're a writer. So are you, I hopefully, more disciplined with your writing schedule and your regimen than you are with working out? Um, yes. It's uneven, but yes, I, a perfect day for me is writing in the morning and then doing businessy type stuff in the afternoon, and that, that's a good day. Plus, also, I think you, you are married, you have two children. Yes, correct. So you also uh, have to... 16, my daughter is 16, and my son is 13. Oh, mitzvah, is he going to have a bar mitzvah? Well, you know, I'm a secular Jew, so we have something called a secular, we had a secular bar mitzvah. What the hell is that? Is, <laughs> it's <coughs> excuse me. It's sort of an invention of my family where we kind of have our own rituals and our own. Um, but it's supposed to sort of mark the moment of uh, becoming becoming a little bit more adult. Well, wait, you know, you can't turn a bar mitzvah into festivus. I mean, it's either a bar mitzvah or it isn't. Did you go into a shul? Did did uh, he read from the uh, the Torah or anything? We didn't do any of those things, but we had readings. You know, readings we had. People come up and told jokes. Songs were sung. All right. Did you, did you have um, herring in wine sauce? Uh, no, we, but we did have beer and we did have wine. You did have and I still... You don't. It's still, I think you're turning him into a Catholic. I think this is a problem. I think you need to, to put a little bit, infuse more Judaism into your, chil your children. But uh, are they doing well in school? Yeah, they are. They're, you know, they're good kids. They work hard. Yeah, they they do good. They're good kids. They're good kids. They don't do good. They do well. What's the matter with you? No wonder they're they're, they're, not, they're failing in school. You're not teaching them proper English. God damn it! Oh my God! I'm sorry to insult you. You certainly have oh. had success as a writer. For example, well, let's let's roll it back to the beginning, sort of, of Greg Codis's career. How did you hook up with the wonderful people who formed the neo-futurist troupe in Chicago, the people who gave us too much light makes the baby go blind? The company was founded in 1988, and I joined it in 1991, so I wasn't actually a founding member, ah. but I guess I was part of one of the earlier uh, casts. I was an actor and writer in Chicago. I was there from 1984 to 1995. I was really interested in improvisation and comedy and writing new plays, and that's a big thing in Chicago. And the Neo Futurists were famous for, first of all, they would always sell out their shows, which was very rare for small companies. So they were famous for that, and they're also famous for somehow bringing together short pieces that could be funny but not, might not be funny too. So they were, they were famous for doing those two things, and, and I auditioned. 
I auditioned for them in 1991, and I was very lucky to be cast. Now, what was the audition process like? Did you have to bring in two or three short minute-and-a-half plays or something? Yes, that's exactly right. The audition was you bring in one play that you wrote yourself, and the New Futures have a very broad and specific definition of what a play is, which is it can be almost anything as long as it's, it's, as it's about roughly two to five minutes. The story that you tell must be true, the character you play must be yourself, and if you do any tasks within the play, they must be real tasks. Like, for example, if you have to cry in the play, you must force yourself to actually cry. Um, so they have a very literal um, idea of what truth on stage is about. So to audition for that company, you need to write a piece that that adheres to that aesthetic and bring it in and perform it for the company. What play do you remember writing for it for your audition? What was it about? I wrote a play, it was, you know, I auditioned in 1991, so this was around the time of the first Gulf War. And I wrote a play called Good Coverage, and it was a monologue talking about how the experience of watching a war, I think the first Gulf War was in some ways like the birth of CNN, I think, in some ways. That's where they really <clears throat> came to the fore and, and cable news became a force for the first time. The play was about the experience of watching a war as a spectator compared to hearing tales of the Second World War and what I, as a kid, what I imagined what I would have done if I were alive in that time and the difference between those two things. Was it a monologue? Yes, it was a monologue, which is just me standing on stage and speaking. And actually, I think for that monologue, I was sitting, actually, I sat in a chair and I was looking through a newspaper, uh, voraciously reading coverage of the war and then taking back on stories of World War II. So when you became part of the neo-futurist troupe, and we're doing too much light makes the baby go blind two or three times every single week late night, what did you learn about theater from doing that that you didn't already know as a writer? You know, for the people who live in Chicago or New York City, because there's a company in New York as well, it is a fantastic training ground for young writers because, number one, you are working within a company, usually it's maybe seven to ten people, so you're seeing people every week you bring in new material. So you get to see how other people approach this task of writing for the stage with this specific aesthetic. And that's a great education because people will do things that you wouldn't think of. And also because you are writing constantly. You know, the format of the show is they do 30 plays in 60 minutes, so each play is about two minutes, sometimes more, sometimes less. Right. And then they they change it every week. Every week they throw out a random number of plays and they write new plays to make up for it. So the, the show, the lineup of material is constantly changing. So you have to constantly write material too for this show. And the great thing about that is, is that writers have their own bag of tricks just like actors or any kind of performer has a bag of tricks. And you exhaust those pretty quickly. And then you have to sort of dig deep into your imagination and into your consciousness and you find that you start to write things that you never would have written if you didn't have the pressure of constantly having to come up with new stuff. So that's just the, the work of it and the doing of it. And also that your work will be in front of an audience every week and, a, and chances are a good audience, good meaning big. So that pressure, I think, is, is really good to keep you disciplined and to keep you stretching yourself. Do you have a very favorite play that you ever wrote or did as part of uh, the Neo Futurists? Well, wow. I, I guess the, um, I don't know if it's a favorite, but the most memorable one to me is the first play that I wrote for the Neo Futurists called Pretzel Pretzel. I was, I was cast in the show, and then you have your first rehearsal. And the, and the schedule at the time was you show up on Tuesday with scripts. There's a voting process that happens, and because usually there's more scripts than slots in the show. Right. So you, so you bring in some material, and then you hope it gets into the show. And the night before my first rehearsal, I didn't have anything. I was like coming, I was trying to come up with stuff, and it wasn't good. And so I had, I think I had a bottle of like Jim Beam or something, and I was sort of up late in my room alone drinking this Jim Beam, and I came up with this really silly play called Pressel Pressel, which is just two men talking about a pretzel. Okay. But that's all that happened really in it. But because of my, you know... Inebriation? Yeah, 
both inebriation and desperation, I accidentally came up with kind of a, a style that was very spare and very kind of... Um, uh, it was minimalist to the extreme. It was a pinter about pretzels, essentially. That's exactly right. It was sort of Pinterest or mammoth esque I don't even know what it was, but it was, I was trying to trying to keep to this aesthetic and not say things that couldn't be said by the, the actors on stage and try to, trying to be funny. So I came up with a, a style that actually I lived with for many years, and I sort of it's still kind of how I write in a lot of ways. Wow. So that was sort of an accidental um, epiphany. Well, what, what was the Ben Franklin thing that uh, writing is... Was it ninety eight percent or two percent inspiration, ninety eight percent perspiration? Perspiration, that was it. I should know perspiration because I I sweat terribly. But I am Rabbi Sal Solomon, the person that I am talking to, who is no longer desperate. Uh, well, we'll get into this. His name is Greg Cotis. He's a playwright, of course. He was part of the Too Much Light crowd. And then, how did you transition from that into becoming a New Yorker? Well, in 1995, you know, it, 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 in Chicago, for young theater people, you come to a, um, a crossroads where you, you, you have to decide if you're going to stay in Chicago and try to make a life for yourself there, or go to Los Angeles, or go to New York City. This was the, uh, the reality for me at that time. And I knew lots of friends who had gone to L.A. and lots of friends who would gone to LA and come back, and lots of friends who had gone to New York, and so I decided that I was going to go to New York. I have roots here. My family is from New York City. I was born in New York. I grew up on the East Coast, so I thought, I'll go to New York and try to make a go of it. Part of my resolution then was to try to begin writing full-length plays. I wasn't really thinking about musicals yet. The reality for theater artists was you have to figure out how to make money. And I didn't really believe that I would be a good enough, <clears throat> excuse me, actor to make money that way. So I was going to commit to the writing thing because I was doing both at the same time. Well, you uh, thought you could make good money as a writer in New York doing what? Well, I mean, writing I, a play is, you know, yeah. I, I just knew, you know, I had written short pieces, and I'd written written full length pieces with a group of writers, but I'd never written solo authored pieces. My only thought was. If I'm ever going to make a living doing this, I have to write my own full-length pieces. And I didn't know where that was going to lead. Maybe it would lead to writing screenplays or for TV. I, I didn't really know. I just knew that I was too deep into the theater thing and to the entertainment thing to go back and to, to, to get a real job, as we would say. Fair enough. Um, so I just I decided to double down on the writing thing and, and see where that led me. So in 1995, I moved to New York City with my wife, uh, Anne Halliday, who was also a writer. And she was also part of the, uh, the Too Much Light crowd, right? That's exactly right, yeah. We, but we met in that company. She actually was part of the company that cast me. So I, I owe my, um, my tenure at Within Your Futures in part to Anne. Wow. Wow, so you're still paying off that tenurehood for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's right. You have to be grateful. Every, every time you want to, don't want to do something for her, she's going to go like, well, you know, I did get you that job. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so... so Lifelong debt. She, she comes with you because she, she also had to make the decision to leave Chicago and go to New York with you. So that, that was pretty yeah. supportive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she, she is from Indianapolis, actually from a sm from Indianapolis and from a town called Zionsville near Indiana. And she talked about growing up seeing New Yorkers, uh, the magazine, like on the coffee table and sort of having a romantic idea of living in that city. And so she was game to move. And we had come to New York several times prior with Too Much Light to do short stints at different small theaters in New York to come and do the show. And we went back to Chicago. And part of our strategy was if we could only create a sit-down company in New York City, maybe good things would come from that. We had only been to New York for maybe a weekend or two weekends and never really long enough to get reviewed or, or to get any kind of... Traction, as it were, yes. Yeah, in attention, which is what you want as a, a theater person. So we thought if we do something extended, then good things would follow. So we came to New York and we set up the company and we ran that for two years 
and then we got pregnant in 1990. You got that pregnant? How, how did you get pregnant? <laughs> well, that's a con- Rabbi, that's a contemporary way of saying that, you know, the woman gets pregnant, but as a way of... Uh, as a, as a, as it's a contemporary way of saying the rubber broke, essentially, is, the, is what we're talking about. No, just kidding. So, but in Mazel McGlick, you had, a, you had a baby. As a matter of fact, there was some, some health issues connected with the, uh, the baby, no? That's exactly right. Um, our uh, child, India, our daughter, um, she had to be in the NICU for 10 days. She had uh, she somehow gotten a terrible infection. Um, and so that was, it was a very dramatic, scary introduction to parenthood. But she, you know, she made it through and we made it through as a young family and she's doing great now. Make mazel thank God, thank God. So, but here, there you are, a broke writer in New York working on plays with a wife, yeah. with a child. How the hell were you supporting yourselves? I worked, I did two different kinds of jobs. The first kind of job I had was working as a temp in various offices. And that was actually great for me because I learned how to type. Good. Uh, which is very useful for a writer just to, to be able to be fairly quick on the keyboard. And also I would choose jobs that were not demanding and I would find them sort of by accident every now and then I would be hired for a job. For example, I was hired at a job at an advertising company and they never, they made me write, me type up maybe a memo every two days and for the rest of the time I was just sitting there. So I would bring my discs and I would write my plays and I would transfer the, the writing from the advertising company's computer to my disc and that's how I would write and that was, that was very, fruitful and productive for me. That's wonderful, because you, you have to be there anyway. They're not giving you any work. You're in a place, and you're not distracted by all the other things of daily life. You have to sit there at that desk. You might as well write. Makes you feel good, in fact. It's wonderful. Weren't you also a, uh, a location scout for Law & Order? That's absolutely right. Um, that was my second job. Is And even better for a writer is I started working as a location scout, as you say, for Law & Order, but for other shows, too. I did some short, uh, I did some independent films, and I worked for Second City, uh, excuse me, Sex in the City, briefly, New York Undercover. So, but for the most part, I worked for Law & Order, and that's a fantastic job for a writer because every day you're sent out into New York to scout locations. You get to see the high and the low, the the, the sweeping penthouse apartments on Park Avenue South, and also the tenements and the really very terribly impoverished hovels that are also in New York City. Actually, I'm a little, a little curious about how this all works. So they would call you or, or email you, and they would say, all right, we have a scene that's going to be set in some person's nice apartment, you know, an Italian family. And then what? You would just go on your bicycle? What, what the hell would you do? Sort of like that. It was, it was an eight-day shooting set, uh, eight-day schedule. So on day one, you come to the production office. At the time, it was at Chelsea Pierce in New York City on 23rd Street, all the way on, on the Hudson River. And you come and you get the script and you read the script. And on that day, later in the day, you're called into the location manager's office, which is your direct boss, and you talk to the location manager. The production designer is the person who's responsible for how everything looks, and the director. Typically, there'll be four days shooting on location in New York City and four days shooting on the set at Chelsea Piers. So as a scout, you might be responsible for one of those days, one or two of those days. And they would say, okay, we have a bank and uh, several exteriors and several interiors, uh, maybe sort of a high-end apartment and a low-end apartment. And we want to shoot them all on one day. So the first thing you do is you go to the most difficult location. In this case, it would be a bank, because banks are hard to... Um, yeah, I mean, you've got to convince them to, all right, so we would yeah, just... And, yeah. and if, it's not, if it's not a bank, you have to find something that looks like a bank. So maybe you oh. might find a derelict bank that sort of is, is closed and doesn't work, or you might find a... Um, a restaurant that you maybe could look like, somehow looks like a bank. So your job as a location scout is to find the bank where they can shoot from 5 in the morning to noon on a particular day. And if you find that location, then your job is then to find all the other locations that are within walking distance of that difficult location. So you then start going around to apartments that look high-end in the neighborhood if you can find it. And usually in New York City, there's, you can find 
find a lot of different kinds of things in the same neighborhood. But how, how the hell do you even get into an apartment? Somebody that you just knock on doorbells and say, hey, can I look around your apartment? I'm a scout. Yeah, sometimes you just ring doorbells. Really? Um, wow. Yep. Sometimes you'll wait outside a door and wait for someone to exit. And then um, many times I would just wait for someone to exit and stick my foot in the door. And then I'm in the building and I would have location letters, which is something on law and order letterhead with an explanation of what we want to do. And I would just go through the whole building, slipping letters under doors. At the time, I had a uh, beeper. You know, I was doing this in the mid 90s. So yeah. I would have people call my beeper and then. You know, we would pay people to... Oh, you would pay for the use of the, the place, of course, yes. Invariably, someone would call. I would spend days going to apartments in a, in a building, looking at the apartment, trying to make a judgment of whether or not this is close to what they wanted, taking photographs, and then um, at the time I would have to go to a one-hour... There was this great place called Flash Photo, this place in the village, and it was run by these two Lebanese guys, and all the scouts from the city would descend on Flash Photo in the afternoon and these are people on all sorts of kinds of jobs they're shooting commercials they're shooting music videos episodic television feature films everything so it was crowded with all these guys who had been out in the city all day long looking for stuff and this was also a great place to make connections you would ask people hey listen i'm looking for a bank somewhere all right they could say oh wow they'll say we just shot in the bank here's all the the contact information so there's a lot of sharing of information and that was that was a great place. And then at the end of the day, in the evening, you then return to the production office with all your photos that you would, you would assemble into what are called location folders, which were these panoramic sweeps of, uh, of the locations that you had scouted, and you'd present them to the location manager, and he would look through them and bet them, and he said, okay, these are good, but these are bad. Let's bring these to the director, and then they would look at it and say, yes, I want to see this tomorrow. And so your job, usually at the end of the day, was to start setting up appointments for the scouting team. It sounds very, a lot more high pressure than you're, you're making it sound the way you're talking about it. It sounds very <laughs> well, time crunched. And it could be, yeah. There were times you wanted to deliver. You wanted to make sure that you had stuff. And, and sometimes it was very, I found it very difficult when I first started. But like with anything, as you get into it and you start to learn how to do it and learn how to manage your time, then you get better. And also your, your contacts spread out. If you're hard up, you can call other scouts who are working on other jobs. And, you know, we did this all the time. Can I ask Greg Kogas, were, is this what you were doing when you started writing You're In Town? It was. That really informed the creation of that, that show because You're In Town is about a, uh, a city that's desperate. And in the mid-90s, in the late 90s, it felt that way to me, just seeing the things that I did, just being on this, being out on location, you know, all day long, you, you see how hard life is for people. You also see the class difference, you know. This is something that is as pronounced as it was 15 years ago. I think it's even more pronounced now. We have the very, very rich and the very, very poor living side by side with each other. And now I think the poor are being pushed out more and more. I think that's the... The reality of, of New York City and well, yeah. a lot of a lot of cities now. But let me ask. I, I think it was a combination of seeing that, but wasn't the germination of the you're in town idea of having to pay to pee, as it were? You're in a foreign country, and you actually didn't have a kroner or something to use a toilet that's stall. That's right. I in this that same year, 1995, which is this big year for me. Um, not only did we move to New York City, but just prior to that, we toured with Too Much Light in Romania, Transylvania, actually. And I decided that I was going to extend our overnight layover in Paris to two weeks so that I could travel around and see some of the capitals of Western Europe. And I didn't bring enough money, and I ran out of money almost immediately. And um, one of the ways that I did not spend money was I didn't visit any of the pay-per-use toilets that they have there. And because I was, you know, Usually I was staying in hostels, which they kick you out in the morning, and you have to sort of be out and about until the evening. So yeah. part of the experience of that was just sort of trying not to use the pay-per-use bathroom. And that's where the inspiration for You're in Town came. Wow. And how long did it take you to write You're in Town, or at least that first draft? I started in around 96, 
and Mark Holman, who's the composer and co-lyricist for Year in Town, he had moved to New York in 93, and I, I moved in 95, and when I came back, when I, when I sort of settled into New York after this trip to Romania, I contacted him and said, hey, I have this idea for a musical, what do you think? He said, that sounds good, and we started writing in earnest, I would say, in 1996, you know, our draft that eventually became the draft that would be produced at the New York International Fringe Festival in 1999. So it was, as musicals go, it was, pretty, it was pretty fast. Yes, yeah, and of course jumping from, because there are a zillion plays that are in fringe festivals, but yours yeah. just went from boom, like a year later you were off Broadway and then right to Broadway. Or, was there an off-Broadway stop or did it go right to Broadway? No, there's an off-Broadway stop. We, we did August, September of 1999 is when we did the fringe festival, and then producers who had come to the fringe festival, they optioned it in December, so there's a waiting period where it's like we're trying to find out whether we would be picked up or not. And then they produced a, a backers audition, which is where you gather talent and you do a reading where they just read from a script and sing the songs on music, uh, music stands. And so they did a backers audition in January of 2000, and they were able to bring on more producers. And then we had to wait a year before things actually got rolling. Um, they had to find a theater, which was very tricky, and we opened off-Broadway. I think our first preview performance was maybe April 1st of 2001, and then we transferred to Broadway in August of 2001. And here's the other thing. This, is, this amazes me. I didn't remember this, but you officially opened the Broadway production of You're in Town a week and a half after 9-11. That's right. We were we were supposed to open September 13th, and of course <laughs> that all changed after 9/11. And they they pushed the opening date back just one week, so we opened September 20th of uh, 2001. And what was that like? I mean, I, I was in New York in that period. Uh, you were living there. You had this show. I mean, what was? Did you have that weird? moment where, oh my God, it's horrible, and I know people who knew people who died, and you know, America was absolutely berserk at that time, and yet was there a little thing in your ear going, oh my God, this is so terrible for my show? <laughs> oh yeah. Both, both those things simultaneously. I mean, we were so involved with this show and pushing it forward, and yeah, you get a little tunnel vision. I'm sure a lot of people had that kind of experience. In the city itself, it was really terrifying. I live in the same place that I lived then, in this apartment in Brooklyn. Our apartment was in the direct path of the ash that came from, you know, we're just basically right across the water from uh, Wall Street. So it was like it was snowing. There was The street was covered in ash and burnt papers. So there was that. New York City was blocked off, I think, maybe 14th Street and below. Yeah, oh yeah. You couldn't. If you took the subway, once the subway started going again, when you passed, one of my trains passed below the World Trade Center, so you could smell the sort of electrical fire smell when you passed it. You know, there was a sense that there was more shoes to drop, that there were more bombs that were going to go off, that this wasn't the only thing that was going to happen. So there was just a, an alertness and an um, expectation that more of these events were going to happen. And let me ask also, uh, talking about you're in town, because it opened a week and a half after the terrorism event, did you cut or have to remove some lines for a while from the show? There was only one line that we removed. And in the story, uh, I guess this is a spoiler, but the show's, the show's been out for a while, so for people who don't know the show, maybe you can, you can close your ears for a second. But in the story of... You're in town. There's a hero. His name is Bobby Strong, and he rises from the masses to take on this urinal monopoly. Um, in the story, people have to they have to use public amenities. They're called in order to go to the bathroom, and private toilets are outlawed. Um, but the public toilets have been privatized, so it's this sort of corporate fascistic state that the world takes place in. And there's a hero who rises to take on the system and to break the monopoly and to seize control of the these public bathrooms for the people. And in Act 2, he's killed by the villain. The villain's name is Caldwell B. Cladwell, and the way that he's killed is he's brought up to the roof of the headquarters of this corporation and thrown off. That's how he's killed. Mm -hmm. And a street urchin named Little Sally, she comes to the rebels to tell them the news that uh, Bobby is dead. And there's one line where she says, <clears throat> he hit the ground like a 
bag of beef. Oh. At the time was, it was kind of, before 9-11, it was, it was funny in its sort of its brutality and its absurdity. After 9-11, though. You know. After 9-11, couldn't imagine sort of say, having this character say this line to audiences that had just witnessed people actually doing that. You know, I mean, one of the most horrific images and realities of 9-11 was people jumping off the roof for the World Trade Center. So that one line was cut. That's the only line. But that was the only, that's interesting, though, that considering the topic and the theme and, and all that. And by the way, uh, if, if we have any listeners in England, isn't the show finally going to get its London premiere this year? Yes, absolutely. Its, it's performances begin, I believe, February 20th, and then we open March 11th. Why did it take, like, 15 years to bring your in town to, uh, to the U.K.? Yeah, it's a puzzle. You know, um, we, it's, it wasn't for lack of trying. We would go. We were soliciting interest. And I think with a show like this and, in, and musicals, generally, luck plays into it. You have to find the right person to do it who has the, the clout and the ability to do it. And that person, I think, really has to love what you've done. So we weren't really able to find that until recently. And I think I'm, I'm actually, I I'm, I'm feel good about it because I think the time feels right again to do this kind of show. The team that we've brought together is really stellar. It's being directed by a guy named Jamie Lloyd, who's a very hot director in, in London right now, and just brought together this eclectic, unlikely cast to do this show. It'll be at the St. James Theatre. Google You're in Town London 2014, you'll find the, the show's website. And, now, after you did You're in Town in New York, and you were at the, the Tony Awards, who actually won for book, and Mark Holman won for the score there, you, you ended up being beaten out by Thoroughly Modern Millie for Best Musical. It happens. But but you got a <laughs> bunch of nominations. Spencer Caden, who was a, a guest on this radio program, she was uh, up there for an award, too, nominated. So now you're in the Broadway community. It's, it's whatever, it's 1999. You've got this award under your belt. Was there... Both a desire and a pressure to then stay in commercial theater? Yeah, I mean, there was personal pressure and wanting to sort of... These opportunities are so rare in, in the creative life. You know, windows open briefly and you want to make the most of it. The most common route for a, uh, a musical is it's, it's a film that they want to turn into a musical. And so we were presented with lots of different titles and properties, as they're called, and we weren't really able to find one that we, we actually worked on a musical version of The Man in the White Suit, which is this oh, yes. studio's film, Alec Guinness, I think. And it's funny, now there's a musical based on another Guinness film from the Ealing Studios, The uh, Kind Hearts and Coronets, has been turned into uh, Gentleman's Guide to Murder, so it, it is doable, I guess, yes. Yeah, we liked it. It was it was sort of up our alley, and it was about sustainability and and environmental issues. And I didn't study theater; I studied political science in uh, in college. Issues that are somehow able to sort of bring the whole society, political, social, economic, together in one story. Those are the things that really sparked the most interest in me. But you were you were still working with your collaborator from your in town, Mark Holman. Were were there opportunities that you either took or didn't take or wanted to that with other composers? Because that's what a lot of people don't necessarily stay working together the whole time. They're like Terrence yeah. McNally or somebody like that. They work with everybody. Well, we have Mark and I have an open relationship, so to speak. <laughs> so to speak, yes. But so far, I've been monogamous. So I just I just work with when I'm working on musicals. I'm just working with Mark. But Mark has many different writing partners. Okay. Musical. So he's, he's doing lots of different stuff. Also, one of the things that I'm getting at is that you had your in town about 15 years ago, the tremendous success. It's been done in colleges, but it's been done all over, and now it's going to be done in London, and yet you haven't been back on Broadway since, and you've done no. some off-off-Broadway, off like you're going to be doing the uh, Give the People What They Want at the People's Improv, which is still it's a pretty small-scale so what have you been working on? Are you been doing screenplays or writing for where? We wrote a, a musical called Yeast Nation, which is kind of a follow-up to Here in Town. And that was done in Juneau, Alaska, in Chicago. And then we also did it at the Fringe Festival in 2011. 
um, and it'll be done again in San Francisco. Oh, very nice. So that's that's another project that uh, you know musicals take a long time to write. Oh yeah. Or at least they take take a long time for us to write. So that's something that we've been working on for fifteen years as well. We continue to work on it. We wrote this version of Man in the White Suit, but that wasn't able to find a producer. And we're currently working on a zombie musical. Um, which is well on its way to finding completion, which takes place in a fast food restaurant, which inadvertently launches a new menu item that turns people into zombies, which is, we hope will be funny and fun and all that kind of stuff. There were a couple of off-Broadway zombie musicals a decade ago. There was Zombie Pop Prom and Zombies from the Beyond. I think there's yeah. one or two others, so just be careful that you're not uh, you know, rehashing that. But I'm, I'm sure you're doing something new and creative and political and, and socially yeah. sly. Yeah, I think it'll be, I don't know, we're not quite sure what it is yet, but uh, I think it'll, uh, we'll see. Well, you know, we'll, we'll see how well it can do. A non-musical playwright, what have you been up to the past decade besides the, the short plays? I wrote um, a play called Pig Farm that premiered at the Roundabout Theater in 2006. Oh, okay. Very good, yes. And that that was that was great. It was um, this uh, kind of like a kind of a it was a, kind of a send up of like American mythological plays. Like it sort of felt like a sexy Sam Shepard play, but it took place on a pig farm, and the family was trying to raise. They were trying. It was a family farm that was trying to work on an industrial level. So they had fifteen thousand pigs on their farm. So it all takes place in the kitchen, like it was like a classic. You know, uh, kitchen, kitchen drama. A, a kitchen sty drama, as a matter of speaking. Yeah, there you go. So, so this is good. So, but uh, are you? Um, I mean, uh, you're still obviously getting these shows done and plays. Do you have any other jobs? Or are you a full time writer now? And, and obviously, you get residuals every time somebody does. You're in town. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to be full time. You know, it's. Uh, it's. I go to my writing space, you know, before we talk. This morning I went to my writing space and, and logged, logged my hours and write my plays and um, and then in the afternoon try to find out how I can get them on. So yeah, that's what I do. Now have you approached uh, Neil Merring and, and Craig Zayden and said, look, you've done Cinderella, how about a live You're in Town on NBC, maybe next Christmas? That sounds like a fantastic idea. I, I totally, I totally agree. Who would, who would you get to play, play Cladwell? Who would be a perfect evil? Uh, can't, well, actually Nathan Lane, but but I was trying to think of somebody really wrong for it, but have a great TV cue. So I uh, know who that would be? Jeez, uh, I don't know. I mean, um, I've written a, you know, I've written a, written a screen adaptation of the of the play. So this is a game that playwrights play in their minds where they. Like who who in Hollywood land would play these things? I don't know. I mean, uh, Miley Cyrus as, as Little Sally. I see it right uh, there. Oh, well, that would be brilliant. That would be fantastic. Get on the phone with Zayden right now. You can do it. I'm telling you. But and <laughs> and your wife is she does a. Uh, we talked about your wife a little bit. Anne Halliday. She's oh. also or she gave up kind of acting to to do what she's doing now. She yep. does a what a magazine. Well, she does a zine. Um, that she's been doing since 1998 called the East Village Inky, um, which is a great portrait of life in New York City. And a zine is a, it's a self-published publication um, that she hand letters and illustrates and just tells stories about life in the city. And so that's, that's her, that's, that's a regular thing that she's been doing. She writes for a website called Open Culture, which oh, cool. is a great website that just sort of, it's like one of these websites out there that covers culture and there's something always interesting that they're writing a, an article about. She's written a number of memoirs. Her best-selling one is called uh, No Touch Monkey about her travels throughout the world. And she's just written a, uh, a graphic novel called Peanut about a, uh, a high school kid who fakes a peanut allergy to get popular in high school. <laughs> Oh, that sounds really that, cool. Yeah, it's great. And by the way, if people want to, to read some of her stuff, you need to know that her first name, we keep saying Anne, but it's spelled yeah. in, a, in a weird way. It's, it's A-Y-U-N, a right? That's correct. 
Yeah, so if you're looking for that, it's A Y U N Halliday. And also, if you're looking for, do you have a website? I do. It's simply gregcotis.com. K O T I S, gregcotis.com. So, yes, Greg, we're going to wrap this up, but it's been wonderful fun. My, I guess my last question, judging by you're in town, even though it's a work of somewhat life based fiction, are you a Malthusian? Um, I am, in the sense that I, I feel that we are living beyond our means. The Malthusian warning is that when you, you, you don't live sustainably, nature will correct that, uh, either by war or famine or some kind of disaster that is as yet unseen. And so I believe that there's too many people who are burning too much oil, all those, all those things which feel obvious and that we are impacting the environment in ways that will will bite us. But do Malthusians have answers or just complaints? Uh, I guess I just have complaints. I mean, I think that's part of the um, project with your town is to not offer prescriptions. What do we have to do in order to save ourselves? I, I guess I do feel there are prescriptions, but there are a lot, many more smarter people than me and qualified people than me who can talk about those things in terms of, like right now I'm reading a book called Countdown, written by the same guy who wrote the book the world without us, just talking about overpopulation and um, why that's a problem. Well, I, um, I have to say that uh, I, I do have, my dear wife Miriam Libby and I have 21 and a half children. <laughs> and we're trying for a few more, I have to, but we, we need, remember after the Holocaust, we still have to repopulate some of the Jews. We'll, we'll reach uh, some kind of plateau and then we'll stop a little bit. But for now, sorry, but um, I'm, we're kind of contributing to the problem on one end, but obviously uh, also contributing to our solution, which is counteracting the final solution on a different end. But that's just yeah. me. Anyway, we have... The Bible, right? Go, go and be fruitful. Somewhere in there, is, the Bible talks about that. Oh, yeah, for a fruitful. We're, we're not even multiplying. We're doing square roots at this point. <laughs> Many as we can. It has been... Uh, Wonderful time talking with the writer, the playwright, the book writer, Greg Cotis. If you are in England this coming year, make sure you see Town on the West End. If not, certainly if you are in New York over this month, January, you're going to want to get to the People's Improv Theater. Is that on West? Where, where is that? I'm sorry, I don't have the address. It's, it's, it's actually on East 24th Street between Park Avenue South and I think maybe Lexington. Um, and they have a website. If you Google the pit, you'll find it. And we have four performances in January. They're all on Friday nights at 8 o'clock. And the show's called Give the People What They Want. And boy, you have given us so much of what we want to hear about life as a writer in New York. Thank you so much, Greg Codis. Thank you, Rabbi.